Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And uh, there are people who are watching this video being recorded in real time and able to get first dibs uh, on the Kayfabe effect because they are supporting our Patreon at the King Kayfabe level. Uh, they get the videos before everybody else, and you can participate in that as well if you hit the link in the description below this video. But by and large, these uh, videos are brought to you by the comic books that we make, and in front of your face is our bibliography. Uh, right now I have the Red Room comics out, X-Men Grand Design, Hip Hop Family Tree, and WYSIWYG. Jimmy is going to have the forthcoming Hulk Grand Design trade paperback out in the wild, working on new Street Angel stuff. He has uh, a Street Angel book uh, from Image out there right now, as well as some hardcover albums. And Plain Janes is his shoujo manga that he has out from Little Brown that is uh, super sexy. But we're sticking in that mid-90s tradition for a minute. Going to take a look at the uh, regular series version of uh, Gen 13 with issue number one, J. Scott Campbell, Alex Garner on inks, and uh, I believe it's the luckiest man in comics, Brandon Choi, as, <laughs> as, as writer of, uh, of this thing right here. We have two flavors of covers. I believe there were about 11 covers. 13. 13 covers, of course. Of course. <laughs> one of those covers being, I think... They innovated the idea of the uh, sketch cover. They had like a blue line, Gen 13 logo. I think there was like a grunge popping out, say, hey, draw your own effing cover or some, something like that, like out of the corner box. But uh, that did not exist before uh, that cover came out. I wonder, the paper quality, like did they print that up on a cardstock? I suspect they didn't because they did everything wrong back in the day and still sold hundreds of thousands. So why, why would they bother? You know what's crazy is like for this was a time when comics were still selling well and this was a popular book. Yeah. I never see those other covers. That's true. This is the first I think this is maybe the first one I've seen in years and years and years and scooped it up. But like I literally even for a marked up price I don't see them. That's true. Wonder how limited those things were. Like they might maybe they were in small quantities, but I never see them because a sketch cover from then would have been cool. Yeah. There was a Bisley cover. Yeah. There, there were a lot of uh they, they were kind of neat. There was a photo cover that was like pulp fiction. I remember the uh Brady Bunch like cover. It was another J. Scott Campbell, if I if I remember correctly. But this one is uh clearly inspired by uh the Sandman series. Yes. Uh but uh I know Dave McKean, and you're no Dave McKean, Don. <laughs> but it's funny to see how, like, through an image lens, like, what is a Dave McKean cover? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let's let's jump into things, man. Here's here's your, your copy of your joint right there. And uh, we're going to take a look at some early uh, J. Scott Campbell. Like, at this point, I mean, this is basically his fourth comic. Yeah, and you know what? I really liked the original Gen 13 miniseries. I bought this, you know, ongoing whenever it came out. And uh, this issue, I don't know, he changes in some ways he does. or something. You know, like, he's so interesting because I feel like all the guys who would work for Wildstorm and all yeah. the guys who would work for Extreme, they would start out pretty close to life of with a couple of exceptions, like a Platt or somebody that showed up with their own style. Right. But a young artist like, like uh, J. Scott Campbell... Very much like you're channeling the Jim Lee, Scott Williams aesthetic of that studio. And he had some other influences. Absolutely. Which is they came out more and more and they came out some in the miniseries, some of the cartoony stuff, the Art Adams. That stuff was what I really liked. Mm -hmm. And something about this one, I don't know, it has a rush quality or a flat quality or maybe it's growing pains quality. Yeah. Yeah, making hay while the sun is shining. Get this out. Might at have the been time. a young guy celebrating a really successful miniseries too. Right. Uh, he but he starts to gel. Like this is what his art sort of starts to become in the future. And one of the th interesting things is because he does build his his aesthetic for sure. But uh, there are downright ghastly uh, proportion things that that he'll do often. It happens with grunge a lot, and a lot of times it's like a big head. Like if we put the tracing paper down. That Fairchild head is gigantic compared to that little ass arm. She's got the Chris Benoit joint there, you know. So that's something that'll pop out. But he's getting slicker, and he's definitely getting more into, like, the Art Adams, like, anime kind of vein. But this is, you know, this is a teenage comic. We're celebrating uh, being a Gen X kid of the 90s. Uh, so they're starting off with video games. Mortal Kombat's out there. Dude, look at the amount of colors. Like, if you scanned this and started sampling, there's greens and blues and oranges, purples. Yeah. Like, every color is in that flesh tone. Page 1 and page 20 are Joe Chiodo colors, man. So so that's that's Joe. That's a staple of his thing. And he's, he's like, one of the few guys in that Wildstorm set that was not afraid to to um, to um draw, uh, to, to, to color with some pinks. I think he had a background as a painter. Yeah. And I can remember my first painting class where it was like, these are the colors in flesh. 
and it was all kinds of colors like that that, that really um I was shocked, you know, like I can remember taking notes and trying to mix up flesh tone colors and it'd be like, there's green in skin? Like, what are you talking about? And then you realize, yeah. And I think that's probably what you get from uh, Kyoto is a guy who comes with a background in painting knows color. <laughs> but they're all, I mean, like, talk about the digital color tricks all over this. Oh, absolutely. They're going, spending some time on that computer. Yeah. And uh, they're playing a Super Nintendo and... You, you'd have no evidence of that by way of, like, the imagery here. Right. I, I would always, like, bristle at that because I, I was a kid of the time, you know? And I'm like, why don't they make it look like a video game? And we know uh, Campbell's background loves video games. Like, you'd think he would have been all... Like, I, I'm sh I feel like this is probably his idea. Totally. But then, like, pixelate that thing up or something. Yeah. Stylize it somehow. It's funny because, like, you know, Brandon Choi is older than him, man. It's, it's, it's close to boomer age, right? And it still... it It's... It's a it's boomer comics like the the dialogue that they say, the way they talk, it's a caricature of how kids in the '90s talked. And uh, when he says, "See, he's he's wearing it on his sleeve," like he turns off the game before registering the new high score. I was there. Ain't nobody give a fuck about high scores in video games since the Atari days. Man. <laughs> like, like nobody gives. So, like, he's his boomerness has is, is, is come out in this panel for sure. You know what, though? This yanking out the video game maybe before the game's concluded. That was a staple in my college. Sure. Now uh, the reset button. We removed the reset button from the Genesis so that my friend Chicken couldn't reset hockey games. <laughs> the NHL '94 baby. <laughs> Friendships were lost. Mm. Indeed. Also forged. A game called Forge? No, no, no. Friendships were forged. Oh, I see. <laughs> there were some late night gaming <laughs> sessions on those yeah. Rocky games. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that made Gen 13 a success was just being different than everything else compared to in, in the, the kind of wild storm. Definitely in the wild tr storm. Tr tradition. And, and Brandon Choi is the writer of so much of that horror shit. That's why you call him the, the luckiest man in comics. Because, like, you know, he's making comics with with his, like, childhood friend, Jim Lee. And uh, the comics, they all have, there's, there's tropes to, to his comics. And it would be, like, organizations that have some uh, acronym that spells out core or arms or guns or you know some bullshit Cats. like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh just all this butch pseudo canon film steve seagal horse shit so this is like the one different comic that's like hey let's have some like kids in like a domestic situation and you need you need an artist that can handle that kind of thing like brett booth would fucking double double light denim pants you know what i'm saying but campbell is not without his flaws and stuff Cause like, look at this Fairchild. She looks like a color form pasted up onto uh, a set of a background. I defy you to sit on a chair that way. You also mentioned her head size on the cover. Yeah. If she stood up right, right there, she's about fourteen heads tall. Well, that's that her is a tall. Yeah, character. she's all legs, man. She's a super tall one, all legs. Uh, grunge is the little squat Wolverine type type character. I think this is kind of an interesting thing that I haven't seen before. Th that, that like, three-quarters aerial view of figures outside of a panel, an open panel, that was something I really liked, and I would yeah. try to copy from, like, Will I can remember, like, Wills and Jim Lee both doing that on, like, X-Men and X-Factor, so they've sure. been doing it for years. It became a staple. But throwing a couple of floorboards under them, kind of neat. Yeah, and and that's, that is not easy to do. These characters are good in perspective. Like, they, they, they are on that floor. I'm imagining that uh, Campbell got, like, did some gritting to uh to get those characters rooted in space like i could imagine it was very hard to draw when i was trying to copy it <laughs> it's hard to do right now man <laughs> it's hard to do right now uh so funny like just trying to nobody you know say any nice things you want to say about campbell's work compared to the other uh, wildstorm guys he still ain't trying to draw backgrounds all that much man so they're just putting these like fucking nonsense yeah. noodles he is doing some stuff, though, that's like comic language. So yeah. you've got a couple of these speed lines, which most, that was an image staple. You'd have sure. speed lines. But breaking up the floor whenever he hits the ground there, that's that's a comic That's comic language. That's the equivalent of uh, sweat, sweat beads coming off. It is. It is. But still rooted. Like, they, he's not going full. No, no, You no. know, like, uh, Kurtzman would tilt it and, and break up the panel, and you see it in chunks. So he's, he's getting little bits in there, but it's still, you know, pre pretty pretty raw, pretty rough. Um, this is issue one, so you gotta, like, sow the seeds for the future, right? So we got Fairchild, she's taking a look at this photo, you see a, a young, uh, Mr. Lynch, 
and then you see his modern day version. He's he's a, a much more affable guy. He was a salty old cuss when you would see him in Deathblow comics, but uh, mysterious nonetheless. Because hey, how did his eye get that way? You know, that's something we got to establish in uh, future issues, perhaps. Notice the eyebrows on all the characters as we go through here, because I think that's a big J. Scott Campbell original element, mm -hmm. you know, compared to the Wild Storm House style. Yeah. And I always think of that Man Ben episode. I think the first one I saw in the drawing, they're like, I forget who the artist is, but he's drawing eyebrows before the eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Urasawa agrees. Yeah. You know, like that's a really expressive piece. And it's like, I think, I think J. Scott Campbell... That was a piece of his stuff, too, because his stuff is cartoony, expressive yeah. in the face, and I think those eyebrows are a secret part of that. J. Scott Campbell influenced a generation with, with this kind of art, but you still see his influences from, like, Art Adams, just Definitely. even in these two faces right here. Um, but when he's building his figures and he's doing his thing, there will be still, like, stuff that's like feels super wrong. So, like, that arm going up, it's like, if you, quote-unquote, drew through it the way they would do an animation or something, there's something quite off about about that piece it doesn't take me out of it though no but you know what's weird is like the full bleed art except it, it's cut off and mm -hmm. then really cut off with that green is like putting in an artificial frame there yeah and also wanted to point out the screen door texture in the background that's something we used to see in like early rob liefeld kind of a weird texture but here it is again yeah that's a that's a that's a at art adams innovation he would he would bring that into his uh 1990s comics uh, I like that their house is like the house from Boogie Nights, where there's like, like the like the drug dude. You were right. With the, uh, uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. Like, what do you call those bricks, man? Yeah, I, I don't know what they're called, but they are. It's just the veneer, you know. It's just those fake fake bricks. <laughs> <laughs> Boogie Nights. That's funny. And you got your hedonistic, horny ass teenage boys. You got your minx like chick who's like, you know, free the nipple, man. Like. These are just boobs. Everybody has them. Dude, this whole, si this whole spread could have been right out of the Boogie Nights comic. Yeah, it really could have, man. It could have been that Nino Hartley chick, man. Mm -hmm. All she needs is a husband who's what, getting cuffed out. What we out. need to do is cut to under the water. Whenever she goes underwater, have the camera follow her under. All these crops, <laughs> like right where the nipples go and stuff. And like, and like, look at this like cheated arm. To make sure that you know what's see. amazing? There's so much early digital coloring where people are like, lens flare, you know, the shitty lens flare. The lens flare's drawn into the ink part there if you look at the ink drawing. Right. Super cool. Yeah. And then, for no reason, we're just going to go landscape. That's how you switch scenes. Yeah, we're going Spider-Man, X-Force. <laughs> and uh, another cool thing about uh, J. Scott Campbell, young dude at the time, and actually kind of capturing the fashions of of the day you would see chicks rocking this kind of shit belly ring all that stuff them kind of doc martin boots and shit and those other uh image wildstorm dudes they're drawing fucking a white button down shirt a, a t-shirt basic pants like they're not thinking about stuff on this level man they, they ain't they ain't drawing no backwards kangles right such a cliche scene, too. How many times have you seen this scene in a, in a comic? Usually, in, or in a movie. Usually, it's a vampire sequence, right? Where, like, the chick is, like, at the club. There's the, the, the stoic guy at the bar staring her down. And, and you know, you, then you get those guys together about to interact. He draws a really good mouth for Roxy throughout. He does. And at different angles and different expressions. Yeah, not easy. Tough. Not easy right here, this kind of stuff. And she's very animated, you know, that jacket is kind of like the tension of it is kind of off. It, it creates that motion that she's that she's moving, doing her thing. Good dancing poses throughout. Uh, and I always liked that uh, he would bring in like just other like this dude with Liberty Spikes. Uh, you know what? I he, think I know some of the stuff I was criticizing about his art. It's very open. And I wonder if that's intentional for coloring. Like mm. if it's something that he's trying to figure out. Because like I'm, I'm looking at this panel and I'm like, man, it's so sparse. You know, yeah. it's just like a, a barely lines to indicate fingers and stuff. But I wonder if that's conscious. And it's like, look, we've got, see how big the digital coloring is. You know, like um, it would make sense that you might try that. Or it might be something that would be even editorially passed down as like, hey, the way coloring is like, go a little bit more open. Yeah, she's getting seduced. About to kiss this dude, gets splashed with some drink, and it, it knocks knocks her, some sense back into her, man. She's in the bar like, damn, I just wanted to go drink, and I'm about to start fucking cheating on my boyfriend. Grunge is her man. This is like the Freaks and Geeks episode, where James Franco experiments with punk one episode. It is, yeah, I, yeah That's yeah. him in the background. Totally. <laughs> What's so funny is, like, I, I have photos of me from, like, a, a kid with green Liberty spikes just like that, man. 
if you took the color out of this face right here, like that's so manga-ish. Yeah. It is very open though, right? Like when you think of like Jim Lee and Scott Williams and like the hatching everywhere, like this is a pretty open line style. It is. And and with the influences of Jim Lee and like Art Adams, that is a restrained thing. But he also has better, like more solid fundamentals than than your other Wildstorm dudes who were hiding all the all their stuff underneath all those ticks and things. You know, he would try some things. So here's another cliche that, you know, began with, you know, Harlan Ellison outer limits episodes and shit where like you got your futuristic douchebags who would just materialize through a portal in a, in an alley yeah electric coming in yeah it totally or like melina from that that met that uh mortal Kombat at the very beginning mm. look it's the same outfit stuff is off the charts at the uh gen 13 headquarters they're gonna have to go find roxy hey so they're set their, their uh headquarters is la jolla right yeah. S same with Wildstorm. How did they never do it? Like uh, characters show up at Wildstorm in one of these books, right? <laughs> yeah, just like the Stan and Jack studio when Doctor Doom shows That's up. That's right. That's I right. get it. I get it. Uh, so here are our bad guys showing up. Uh, throw some shade at Fraggle Boom. Show canceled due to uh, overwhelming lack of interest. And your main uh, guys who show up here, like here's your roster bad dudes. And I think this dude with this backwards Kango and a scar on the eye and... <laughs> And dreadlocks? That's Gary Oldman from uh, True Romance, dude. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of gimmicks to pile on. I always think of Hacksaw Jim Duggan talking about when he was King Hacksaw and had the crown. Yeah. And, and the cape and the two by four and the hoe and the thumbs up <laughs> and the crossed eye. This is, but this is total. Like, I would be shocked if they said that that was not inspired by a Gary Oldman in uh, True Romance. It makes total sense. It's the era. Yes. Yeah, that, that gang of, like, the character design for that group is so wild. I really like that drawing. Totally. He's fun with the mouths. And, and like, he and Joe Manorera, like, like they would fuck with that shit. You know, they would they would twist those mouths and, and get them to do stuff and, and just, like, scream emotion. This is one of those examples of uh, J. Scott Campbell having some fundamentals when it comes to underdrawing. That is a hard angle to draw. Everything is anchored really well. The eyes are inside the, the sockets of that skull really good. There's good perspective on that nose. The jowl is good. And and the colorist is abiding by the things that... Uh, they are, but also, doing. like, this is the future of coloring right here. Like, there's all kinds of modeling being done there by the colorist. Sure. I keep looking at this and thinking, like, is this book much later than I thought? Because everything's here, right? We've got yeah. Richard Starkins doing digital lettering. We have coloring that is not that far from what we've got in today's world. And yet it's 1995. Sure. Like this is a cutting edge comic in 1995. Yeah. And and imagine what a Marvel comic from 95 looks like if you really want to have some fun at home. Yeah. Pull out a 95 comic and compare them because this stuff was like years ahead. It really was, man. It was still on that newsprint. And, but they were like bringing some computer color at that point. But it was very ugly. The best computer color and by best in 1990s standards was lots of bells and whistles and you know this this aesthetic the marvel colorists and and, and the uh the the dc stuff they could not accomplish this Campbell this is this is manga reading it is because it reads from right to left a lot better than it does it's, almost, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a weird backwards move if you read it western style sure sure but he's twisting up that the figures in more adventurous ways once again than any of the wildstorm guys would do like their shit would look so disjointed and, and just off. They would yeah. never be this courageous. That is not a uh, photo-referenced figure. No. And I like that. Yeah. Our guy standing on the perspective, uh, on the horizon line, the eye line, that's something that I always like to make note of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a zine. And uh, listen, play the hits, right? Kitty Pride had Lockheed. Let's introduce a little cartoon uh, Muppet that uh, the Gen 13 crew can have. She's got the choker chain, by the way. That's a, some real, real ninety staple. Uh, this is a very heroic shot of uh, of our guys right here, man. I, I always love this image. And in issue one, you you only get like one of these, you know. Like they 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 spend a lot of time in domesticity to to get us to this part. But there's good movement. There's a lot of curves in the back pers background perspective to kind of create that movement. It really does feel like they're barging in. Good pose on Fairchild there. Doing a team shot like that, and all these team books needed it, from X-Men to whatever, you know, name your book, 
they're a lot harder than they look. For sure. And, and when they fail, they fail hard. But you're expected to do that. If you're drawing one of these team books, we want a money shot of the team. And it's not that easy to do. That one's pretty good. Yeah, this is one of those fun pieces right here with grunge, where you see how their shoulders are coming down. Uh, so many of us would use action figures as kind of our... Uh, sort of reference to show that chest twisted around and things. But you know how action figures work, certainly of that time. the There's a trunk, torso section, and the arms just kind of fit in. Look at, there's no give to the, to the collarbone at all, and those arms are just kind of straight down. It just looks like a toy. Yeah, there's some real kayfabe muscle going on with him. Like, especially as we see, like, some of the back muscles. Yeah, that piece right there. Yeah, you do, you learn that French braid technique, and then you just braid it, you braid the muscles and then and then you're you're kind of you're close cuz i defy you take a look at uh you know uh who's who's the the big bodybuilder guy that chris burn or brum or something like that like uh you look at the that bag it looks like mashed potatoes like underneath skin it's symmetrical on both sides i think that's something you got to keep uh, accurate this is a pretty nice use of the deluca effect having that figure dancing around his head and, and pretty advanced. Cause I mean, you could just have some stars there and call it a day. That's the other thing too. Like, uh, this is a more playful book. There's a little bit room to move. You don't got to take it seriously. And the fun thing is you could do a lot of things if you don't take it seriously. Plus the other wild, wildstorm books, they were impossible to take serious for all the pretense and effort. They were trying to make those things be serious and, and hardcore. It was a fucking joke. So like, lean into the joke but it almost doesn't get more 90s than this jimmy yeah for sure not a bad thing i have a lot of fun memories of the 90s comics so lean into them now and then <laughs> you know good kind of 10 page fight sequence uh this the computer coloring on this panel here where our guy gets zapped out is something that i always like 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 i uh, i responded to the computer coloring on the Gen 13 series, I, I thought that that it was a good matchup uh, with um, the Campbell art and the the Gardner inks. It was also pretty new. Like yeah. every book didn't look like this or derivative of this. Yeah. And I like I said a minute ago, this to me is the highest level of it at the time. Absolutely, and and I mean he will. Th this this pushes the art of comics forward, and people start to or backwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people they're at least doing something different from Jim Lee. Put it in, in Rob Liefeld's words on the Kayfabe channel. Jim Lee started to draw like J. Scott Campbell. Yeah. And bring those elements in. But, I mean, go down the list of Gen 13 comics after this. Everybody's trying to do J. Scott Campbell. This line on her face and neck for, like, a lighting or something, a double lighting, the colorist more or less ignores it. It does, yeah. But it's a really bold, drawn line. Yeah. Don't see a lot of shading like that. As you could have expected, uh, the bad guys have to retreat like a bunch of cowards. And Gen 13 is left standing there being the heroes that they are. Cut back to La Jolla, to the Boogie Knight's house. And uh, they got a new pet. His name's Queef mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, <laughs> Lynch is just telling him, guys... The uh, those all those monsters that just came through that portal, they came because they wanted some queef. <laughs> and if he stays with us, you you best imagine that uh, we're we're that's not the last we're going to see those guys. Very by the numbers. It's a really uninspired first issue. It is. It, it, it feels like um, uh, like an amateur's first issue where like you don't really have big storylines or or supporting characters or anything, or even a mission. And so, you know, it's kind of this throwaway story, except it's an issue one. Yeah. You know, like, like bizarre to me because you had time to plan it. Like always with an issue one, like if things don't land to me, something went wrong because you had time. This yeah. wasn't like issue seven and you're trying to stay on a monthly schedule. It's like, yeah. it's issue one. What's the best way to set up this series? And I don't know if Queef was it. <laughs> you got to check out the old Kirby comics that he wrote himself. Or even the Silver Age Marvel stuff. But very often, you read the uh, the Kirby Fourth World books, or Devil Dinosaur, or Eternals, or something. You're getting the series MacGuffin. Yes. In that issue. Like, the thing that's going to kind of propel the story engine. The thing that, like, you're going to be able to hang every issue on is introduced so clearly in those comics 
that you know the score. You know exactly what you're in store for. And uh, it gives you something, like I said, to, to sort of hang your hat on when you're creating the next round of stuff. Yeah, because I read this issue and I don't know, like, what are what's their team story even? Are they on the run? Are they underground? Is somebody after them? I have no idea. Right. You know, like, why does this series exist would be my question and, after reading this issue. And you use the word amateur, but, like, they're, they're only professionals by virtue of Jim Lee paying some money to some dudes. He is giving money to his childhood best friend who has no stripes, you know, like, is probably, you know, maybe the best person that could write a comic that Jim Lee knew or something. You know what I mean? Like I have no idea what gives uh, that dude qualifications for anything other than being Jim Lee's homie. I think it's a good comparison that you make with Jack Kirby and an issue one. Yeah. Because it, it, it does feel night and day difference in terms of like, it's an issue one, it's a launch. Right. There's the, the artists of your 13 covers. You get an art Adams in there. John Cleary. I'd be curious to see that one. Friendly Neighborhood Grunge. Oh, I know that one. That's like the Spider-Man 1 cover with grunge as in the in the Spider-Man uh, rule. Michael Golden, Gen 13 goes Madison Avenue. Yeah, I don't know Why that Why aren't these all pictured in here? Like, give us the, at least a page with like little, little uh, stamp-sized versions of them. That would have taken uh, some thought, Jimmy. I guess so. And uh, they're not in the business of thinking. They're in the business of making hay while the sun is shining. And in uh, 1995, March... This is the most popular image comic at this moment. I would, I would, uh, I would hazard a guess. Yeah, I bet you it is. Ah, oh, man, interesting, interesting times. Kind of an interesting artifact. This is funny right here because it it literally looks like PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, like like they imp- they put it into a computer program. They vectorized it, and you can imagine this bouncing around on your Windows 95 screen when you leave the mouse still for too long. Makes me really curious, like, what's the software? Right. What are they making that, I guess, early 3D out of? Yeah. Fun stuff. It is fun. And, and you know what? As much as we make fun of that logo in early 3D, like, it's another point of, I don't know that Marvel's doing anything like that. You know, I feel True. like Wildstorm and Jim Lee and, and everybody, they're investing in this department. And when they sell to DC, I think that was a part of what they were selling. Sure. Yeah, yeah, some 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 updated stuff, and uh, Grifter. I, I agree. You see Grifter in comics, man. You don't see much other uh, of their characters, but I see Grifter every now and then, man. Jimmy, you good to go? Yes. K Fabers and uh, the uh, King K Fab patrons were the first people to uh, to to see this comic uh, while we were even recording it, and they get the videos ahead of time. If you want to experience that and mitigate the K Fab effect completely. Hit up the description in our uh, video below. You're going to be able to jump on board on that Patreon and, and get videos ahead of anybody else. Also, we're makers uh, in the game, and these are the books that we need you to support so that we can continue uh, bringing these videos to you on the regular. Jimmy, tell the people what's out there. Hulk Grand Design coming to stores in February. You can still pre-order that one. Big oversized fluorescent green cover. You want it on your shelf, but pre-order it because they're printed now and it's a limited number. Mm -hmm. Street Angel, Deadly Squirrel Alive, and The Plain Janes are already in print and available wherever you buy books. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see more of my comics, my upcoming comics, as well as download some of my out-of-print zines and mini comics. You see the bibliography in front of you, man. Red Room uh, is the comic I'm working on these days. Red Room Anti-Social Network and Trigger Warnings. Uh, Trade paperbacks are out there as we speak. All stories self-contained. I'm serializing the next round of Red Room comics on my Patreon before anybody else gets to see that stuff. Hit up uh, the link tree in the de- description below. You can get to those destinations. But I have Hip Hop Family Tree, X Men Grand Design, and WYSIWYG uh, out on stands uh, as as we speak. Go to your local comic shop, scoop up the comics. Jimmy, what else do we have out there? Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t shirts, merchandise, mugs, hats, all kinds of good stuff at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel. Given those marching orders, Jimmy will be on our way. Read more comics.